Hi, I'm Caitlin Phillips, and this is The Side Comment. On today's episode, we have Richard Toy, author of Winston Churchill, A Life in the News. He explores the ever-changing relationship between Churchill and the burgeoning media landscape of the 20th century. Hello, I'm Richard Toy, Professor of Modern History at the University of Exeter, and I'm a specialist in British political and imperial history. I've written several theme studies of Churchill, of which Winston Churchill, A Life in the News, is the latest. The book investigates the theme of Churchill and the news in three dimensions. Churchill's own writings, his media image, and his efforts to influence and control the media. The innumerable biographies of Churchill all deal with his early journalistic exploits, his involvement with the British Gazette during the general strike, his relationships with the press lords, and so forth. Until now, though, there has been no thorough and comprehensive assessment of how Churchill's own media life intersected with the wider issues of press freedom and political iconography. The book relates Churchill's own personal proclivities to broader themes such as media manipulation and the globalization of news. Churchill was a master of publicity who cultivated a new form of political celebrity. There were precursors. Palmerston, Gladstone and Disraeli had all had their personal cults. What was new was the sheer scale of Churchill's coverage and its transmission across the world. Churchill's longevity as an object of public discussion, including posthumously, is one of the things that make him special, if not absolutely unique. Moreover, although the media did become more intrusive and in some ways more challenging of politicians over the course of his life, Churchill, dependent on his career stage, had many routes to informal influence over what was printed. He was a public political personality who brought elements of his private life into the public sphere, but in a way that he was generally able to control. Churchill then was a politician who courted the media, albeit during his final period in office, he seemed to be losing his touch. At the same time, as will be seen throughout the book, he often showed bitter resentment of the press and also the BBC. Of course, some of the treatment he received was deeply unfair. In the search of circulation, some newspapers often played fast and loose with the facts and made spurious allegations. Others displayed blatant ideological bias. But even making all due allowance for the frustrations that politicians typically suffer, and indeed for the extreme stress that Churchill experienced during both world wars, his profound sensitivity is notable. Throughout the book, we see both how he nonetheless strived in the heat of the media battle, and how, in part because of robust institutional constraints, his autocratic and repressive instincts against journalistic freedom were successfully contained. Churchill was not merely the passive subject of British and global news culture. Rather, he himself did a great deal to shape that culture. He did so in a variety of ways, not least through his own prolific journalism and through his attempts to influence editors and reporters. He was by no means always successful, though, and even when official control was enforced, he was frequently the subject of gossip and rumour, the improvised news that people generate amongst themselves to help them form, help them make sense of their worlds in the absence of concrete information. The book shows how the development of Churchill's public life was influenced by the demands of the media and how press, film and radio contributed to the many ups and downs of his career. The book draws on an extensive range of personal, governmental and organisational papers, published diaries and memoirs, but media sources from Churchill's own lifetime are of particular importance. Within limits, it is possible also to analyse how ordinary people reacted to news about Churchill. The sources on this are richest for the World War II years, when both the Ministry of Information and the Sociological Research Organization Mass Observation collected a huge amount of evidence of popular opinion. For example, Mass Observation went as far as recording the number of seconds of applause when public figures, including Churchill, appeared in cinema newsreels. As far back as December 1945, the journalist Frederick Mullaly argued that any conscientious future Churchill biographer would be obliged to engage with this press material. He said, no matter how intimate his relationship with the subject, no matter how free the flow of confidences and reminiscences between them, there is no substitute for diligent, methodical note-taking from the press cuttings dated 1900 onwards. Here will be found the raw, unadorned substance of Churchill's vacillating career, political campaigns that the world has forgotten, speeches that have been excluded as if by conspiracy from every hack panegyric masquerading in the form of biography. Mullaly, who was of the socialist paper Tribune, was a harsh Churchill critic, but his point stands. Reading the newspapers, as well as engaging with film, radio and TV sources, helps us see more clearly the sheer variety of ways in which Churchill was perceived and presented within his own lifetime. In turn, this helps us understand how his image has evolved down to the present day and why he remains an emotive and divisive figure.